Good morning. Welcome to Worship at the First Congregational Church of Clarendon. Today is Sunday, April 25th, and our scripture for this morning comes from the sixth chapter of Matthew's Gospel. We are reading from verses 5 through 15. Now our scripture for today follows on the heels of our scripture from last week where Jesus asks us to examine the motives behind the good we would do. Do we do good things to receive the acclaim of others? Or do we seek only that God would be pleased by our good actions? And this is true whether we are talking about how we give, such was a topic from last week, or for today, how we pray. Now, prayer certainly is a time between a believer and God, even as when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we know that all believers are united in Him. Our relationship with God matters, as does our relationship with others. So let us worship God. Majesty, worship His majesty. Unto Jesus be our glory, honor, and praise. Today, I'd like to talk about something pretty important, and that's one that Jesus has in our scripture lesson today about our relationship with God and our relationship with others. And he does it through the teaching of the Lord's Prayer. Now, forgiveness, it's part of the Lord's Prayer. And I have to ask, has there ever been a time that someone has done something wrong or hurtful to you that made you upset, that made you angry even? And it was hard to have to forgive that person. Well, and maybe put it on the other shoe is to say, have you ever done something that you knew was wrong? Maybe you hurt a friend. Maybe you did something that you shouldn't have done them in your family. And yeah, it's hard to admit when we do wrong things, but 
it is important to say we're sorry and it's important to ask for forgiveness. Sometimes we as people have a hard time forgiving someone, but it is a great thing that God forgives us again and again. So I'm going to take my notebook here and I'm going to write, I forgive others. I forgive others. Well, oops, I didn't spell it quite right. So I better take my eraser and fix a mistake. Oh dear, but I, I guess I didn't choose a very good eraser because I don't know if you can see that, but it's kind of smudgy. It didn't really erase it completely. And unfortunately, that tends to be somewhat like our human forgiveness. We say, oh yeah, I forgive you, but we still remember it. We still don't want to trust that person. Or we still hold on to some resentment and anger about something someone have done to us. So we have a hard time really forgiving. And then there's how God forgives. I have a whiteboard here. And the lovely thing about a whiteboard, of course, is that if I write on it, and I'm going to write, Jesus forgives me. Well, when I make a mistake and I need to ask Jesus to forgive me, the joy is that, look at that. Jesus erases my sin completely. It's as, ever, as if I never wrote anything on the board at all. It's as if I never did that sin ever because it's gone. Jesus has forgiven me. And so Jesus really wants that we would forgive others the same way that Jesus forgives us. And for this is what he says in our scripture verse. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. Let's have a prayer about that. Dear God, we thank you that you give us mercy and forgiveness and help us to do better at forgiving others when they have hurt us. Give us peace, not bitterness within us. Thank you for erasing our sins and thank you for your love. We love you, God, and we thank you for Jesus. Amen. I hope you have a lovely week. Miss not seeing you and hope to see you soon. Be blessed in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us now, as God's people, come before him in our time of prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are grateful for all the blessings you give us. And we want to become people just like you. It's so great that we may talk things over with you and that you will lead us in right paths, that you will help us when we need it, because you're glad when we ask, when we seek, when we knock, because then you may give us good gifts that enable us to grow in wisdom and maturity. You bless us with the gift of the Holy Spirit, your very presence inside of us to guide us, to lead us to you by which we may acknowledge that Christ is Savior.
Lord, you know how hard some days it is in our struggles to be more like you. You know when we worry about things, whether it's our finances or our families. You know when we are trying to juggle bills and take a burden of worry away. Sometimes we hold too tight to the things we have. We forget that all things come from you. We pray for humble hearts, generous hearts, compassionate and giving hearts. Because you hold all of life in your hands. May we not hold too tight to the gifts we've been given as if they were meant for us alone. So we ask forgiveness for the wrongs we have done. We ask your help in learning to forgive others the wrongs they do against us. We hold on to our grudges too long. And it's really hard sometimes releasing our resentment against someone who hurt us. But your desire is that we should be healthy, both in my body and in spirit. So set us free from holding on to our anger so that we may forgive others as you forgive us. We love you. We praise you through your son, Jesus. Thank you for each person who is worshiping that we may not see them, for the blessing that you give each one. Fill us all with your love and then send us out that we may be a gift to someone else. We pray for all those on our prayer list. We pray for those who are homebound by COVID. We pray for the health and safety of all those in our country. Hear our prayers, for we offer them in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we pray as he taught us to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture for today, as I mentioned before, is from Matthew's Gospel. We are continuing through what is called the Sermon on the Mount, and we are now in chapter 6. We begin today with verse 5. Uh, if you want to pause this video for a moment and get the right place in your Bible, that way we may read together. Hear these words of our Lord when he says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. 
Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. May God bless a reading and understanding of his holy word. Amen. We talked last week about how Jesus describes the characteristics of God's kingdom, the kind of righteousness that God wants to see in us. We talked about worship and how our giving is part of our worship, giving glory in all we do. We don't give charitable donations to the church or any other organization to show that we are good people, we are to give and serve others out of the love that God has given us. The purpose of any act of righteousness is not to receive praise from others, but our giving should be a decision made between God and us alone, an expression of our love and faith. Maybe you don't think uh, often about giving as an act of worship because honestly, oftentimes it's really not intended to be that. And and I think specifically of institutions or hospitals that give naming rights to one who has donated much of the money for for a building or an addition. Um, Like the Seidman Cancer Center, part of Jaga Hospital or you know, donors of PBS programming, names put on the wall of a new museum wing. And no doubt, the persons who donate to hospitals or other nonprofit institutions, they have good reasons for doing so. They may not be looking for a reward from God, and that's fine. But Jesus says, for his followers, Their giving should be different. It should be an act of worship. Now today, uh, Jesus is addressing right attitudes towards prayer. Now in the first bit that we read, it's quite possible that Jesus was speaking about, you know, Jewish priests who wanted to show off of their piety, who would stand on street corners or in the synagogues for all to see. So these verses are kind of aimed at religious professionals because, you know, what lovely turns of phrases those religious professionals can try to use to impress somebody. But does that make me or them any more pious in the eyes of God? (laughs) Not at all. I was reading in Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, where Jesus gives the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And it begins with these words. It says, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. So Jesus says there were two men one day who went to the synagogue to pray. The Pharisee stood and prayed about himself, bragging about how he was not like other men, you know, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even that tax collector. 
like our scripture from last week. This guy was quick to pin medals on himself for giving his tithe of 10% and fasting twice a week. Was he headed for trouble? Oh, absolutely. Then Jesus goes on to describe the tax collector and his prayer attitude differed from that of the Pharisee. First, Jesus says that the tax collector stood at a distance. Did he feel himself not worthy of coming any closer to God? And he would not look up to heaven, but kept his gaze down in an attitude of contrition. And he beat his breast as he cried out, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus concluded this parable saying, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And here in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Now, it was many years ago now when I served a church in Vermont. And there, the parsonage had a prayer closet, had a small altar, had a place to kneel while one was at prayer. It was really special. But I'm going to say that prayer is not necessarily about having a place apart, but possessing a heart that draws apart from worldly praise in order to draw near to God. We can be fully engaged as a body of Christ in this church. Yes, my prayers may be spoken and your prayers are echoing in silence as you hear this video. But God is honored and worshiped. Or you or I may be alone, feeling compelled to pray. Maybe your prayers are whispered or spoken or only up in your mind. You pray in silence. Maybe you're sitting down. Maybe you're taking a walk. Maybe you're even alone driving in your car. Prayer's good when we pause to give God and God only the praise. Prayer, it, it is central to worship, but like many other things, even when we pray, yeah, we can take the attention off God and put it on ourselves. And then the second problem that Jesus mentions is that when people babble on like the pagans did, who use lots of words, thinking it's going to make a difference in God's eyes. But it's not about the words we say, but praying often and meaning it. I think about another parable that Jesus once told, encouraging us to pray constantly, consistently, and not give up. Well, this is also found in the 18th chapter of Luke's Gospel. So this parable was about a woman, a widow, and she kept coming to this judge asking for justice. As Jesus described him, the judge neither feared God nor cared about others. But finally he decided he would make sure this woman received justice, lest he be worn out by her continual coming. And Jesus says, Listen 
to what the unjust judge says. And will God not bring justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So we've had two examples of what prayer is not. It is not about putting the attention on us. It is not about using lots of empty words. But like the example from last week, prayer is worship when God is praised and not us. All of us can be too quick to ask God to give us what we need and way too, quick, way too slow to give God the glory. And so Jesus gives us a sample prayer that we know as the Lord's Prayer. Now, it was first given that title in the year 250. Um, and if you've got your Bible open in front of you, and you're scanning the verses of the Lord's Prayer, you can see that the first three verses, verses 9 through 10, are directed towards God. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But then, verses 11 through 13, these are about our petitions to God. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. Now, a couple of interesting tidbits I learned this week as I was um, preparing this message. First, that Jesus quite possibly was thinking about the Ten Commandments when he gave the disciples this prayer. You see, the Ten Commandments also starts with our relationship with God and then deals with our relationships with others. Matthew, in his gospel, was likely linking Jesus with Moses from Matthew's emphasis on how the Old Testament reveals Jesus who ushers in the new covenant. Now we, as Protestants, end the Lord's Prayer with words that come from later manuscripts. We say, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now my pew Bible has that as a notation in the very bottom of the page. And it says it's from later manuscripts. So we don't add it in, but often it was added in. Well, then we've got Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer. It's in chapter 11 of Luke's Gospel. That version's even shorter. Um, it's missing words praising God at the beginning, as well as one of the petitions to God. And a notation at the bottom of that page adds some of them back in and says it came from some later manuscripts. Well, that leads me also to believe that Jesus taught this prayer on a number of occasions, different variations with different times and reasons. And so I see the Lord's Prayer as one example of how we can pray. There's a whole lot I could tell you about the Lord's Prayer. I actually Googled sermons on the Lord's Prayer and I got over six million results. And I'm sure there's some very meaningful insights one might gain from any one of these sermons. But for now, I'd like to focus on the relationship. The relationship we have with God, as well as the relationship we have with others. Because what's the first word in the prayer? Our, our Father, yours and mine. 
You know, even if I'm all by myself in my little prayer closet, or you're watching this video all by yourself, our, that little word helps us remember that there are others who are also praying, who are also seeking, who are also wanting to grow in faith and commitment. And together, together we are a family under God who is Abba, our Father. So there never can be just me and God and forget about the rest of the world. I remember some wise words my pastor once said. I've never forgotten that he said how it is when we're young that our circle of people is very small. Oh, and that has been especially true this past year as I think about my little grandson. He does not know many people. But then as we mature, our circle of friends grows larger. But perhaps at some point in our aging years, it can grow quite small again. I read an article in the New York Times this week about a woman who wrote into the paper saying that COVID was her friend, which was a little bit surprising. And, and the reason she said is because it gave her exclusive time with her husband who was at home in hospice care. Well, some months later now, the paper reached out to some of those respondents and she was one of them, asking her for some updates. And she said that then hospice um, was over. Her husband had passed away just a week ago and that for now, she said COVID was cruel because it kept her from experiencing much comfort from other people. I don't want my circle of relationships to grow smaller. And I don't think God intends that we should ex cultivate a relationship with God to the exclusion of other believers. You know, meditate on that word, our, as you pray. See who comes to mind. Do you pray for those who are on the verge of writing again one more instance of excessive police force? Or do you pray for families in Brazil? I read about there so many babies and young children are dying of COVID. Whatever are your prayers for the unseen hour of those beyond your door? No, we, we cannot solve the problems of the world, but we can offer them to God in prayer. Know that God has infinite power to heal and comfort and carry our human burdens upon his very capable shoulders. And as we pray, we grow to depend on God and allow him alone to be in charge. So prayer, it strengthens our relationship with God, but Jesus also reminds us that we must find in prayer the means to grow in our relationships with others. For in his model prayer, Jesus teaches us to ask God for forgiveness as we Forgive those who have debts against us. And then, in the last verse from our scripture today, Jesus repeats this injunction. If we forgive others, then God will forgive us. But if we fail to forgive the sins of others, neither will God forgive us. If there's no other topic, to bring to God in trying to be strengthened in our relationships with others. Finding forgiveness is critical. 
You know as well as I do how hard it can be sometimes. How to let go of our grudges, let go of our resentment, our anger against someone who wronged us. I cannot know what pain someone has caused you or what, what gap, what schism has resulted from some very hurtful time. But God does. And God wants us to pray about it, that it may get resolved. Luke's Gospel writes that as Jesus was on the cross, he prayed these words. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. So Jesus is our example. He asked that God would forgive us, and he died on the cross for our sake. And as we pray this prayer that Jesus taught us, may we draw closer to God, our Father, and learn better how to forgive our neighbor. May God give the glory in all we do. Amen. As we conclude this, our online version of our worship service for this morning, may you go in peace. May God fill you and use you according to his holy will. May Christ, our Savior, gift you with wholeness and purpose in ministry. And may the Holy Spirit dwell within you with grace that you may bring praises to God's name, both today and forevermore. Amen. Preaching and